Welcome back to the Wellbe podcast and show. This is your host, Adrienne Nolan-Smith, and thank you so much for joining. I know this will be an awesome episode and very timely. Today, I have Dr. Will Bolsowitz, who is double board certified in gastroenterology and internal medicine. He's also the author of a new book coming out called Fiber Fueled. Will, thank you so much for being here. Adrian Nolan-Smith, it's great to be on the show with you. Should we tell them right yeah, off the bat? Totally, totally. So what happened was we did this a week ago, right? We did A this week ago, week. yeah. I normally have my Zoom settings to auto record. And I also thought I'd double check that it was recording. And we had an awesome hour long conversation that was not recorded. So that was tough. But we I both- I feel like we're good friends now. I know. Like, I yeah. feel like we're really good. We're connected. Now we know each other really well. I was really happy to enjoy talking to you. So doing this, you know, two hours was fine with me. But obviously, Will is a very busy doctor. So I felt terribly that he has to take the time twice. But um, anyway, thank you for doing this again. Well, it's all good. And, you know, I was a busy doctor. And now I'm a doctor wearing jeans. And, you know, times have changed. Um, So it's a crazy time that we're going through right now. Yeah. So of course, when you watch this episode, it might be, you know, probably April, May, June, I'm not sure exactly. But um, at the time that we're having this conversation, the coronavirus global pandemic has just really unleashed itself on the US. And we're all quarantined and, you know, doing sort of shelter from home type stuff, or at least we are in New York State and Connecticut now with all closed businesses. And Will, what's the situation down in South Carolina? We are not under any formal order to do anything. But thankfully, I think people have um, opened their eyes to what's going on out there. And so people are definitely doing the social distancing thing, going into isolation. And I I feel bad because I, I know several small business owners. I'm a small business owner, and it's not a fun time right now. The number of people and businesses that are just completely shut down that I know, it's unbelievable. And again, when you're watching this episode, things might have played out worse or better than expected. But right now, it seems like it could be really, really big tragedy for an entire country and world based on not just how many people are going to die and be sick, but also how many people are going to have to start over with and, and shut businesses because they can't survive this. No matter how many trillions of dollars they try to inject into our economy from the government, I, I know that there are just businesses that can't make it a couple months being closed or however much it is. So I feel for, for everybody, I feel like you're going to be okay, Will, but that's just my guess. As far as your business, everyone needs doctors for sure. So Today, given the coronavirus, Will and I were thinking it would be best to share with you guys a lot of information regarding how the immune system and the gut interplay, which is, they're very related, spoiler alert, but his focus is really on fiber because he's done a lot of research into how that really is, you know, an essential part of a healthy gut. And we don't talk about it enough. I think gut health is talked about quite a lot at Wellbe, but not specifically about the role of fiber. So that's why I really wanted to have him on the show to, yeah. to dig into that more. But we can start with, how did you get into all of this? Because I know that for a lot of us, it's really personal. I think you have a personal story too. Um, and there's not many people who just go through conventional healthcare training and then come out the other side of it saying that fiber is the answer. So um, I'd love to have you share a little bit about how you got from medical school to where you are now. I honestly hope that when people read my book, Fiber Fueled, that there will be people who, when they put it down, they, they say, fiber is the answer. And it's more than fiber. It's not Metamucil or a supplement. You know, this is about the food that you eat and the, the effect that it has on your gut microbiome. But if you go back 15 years ago, when I was in medical school, we weren't talking about the gut. We weren't talking about the microbiome. And that's around the time that I decided that I wanted to be a gastroenterologist. And I made this choice because I just loved the different organ systems. So like if you're a cardiologist, you just think about the heart all day long. That's all you deal with. Whereas for me, I'm the expert on the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, the large intestine, which you can call the colon, the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, like all that stuff is my expertise. Now, 
when I met my mother-in-law for the first time, she was like, hold on, you brought home a proctologist? What is this guy? Who the heck chooses to be a gastroenterologist? I loved the balance between using my mind to take care of patients and also using my hands to do procedures and really to make you know a diagnosis or to treat something very quickly. So that's where I started. I went through medical school and felt invincible. I was young. Everyone in my family had always been skinny. I was a great athlete back in the day and was working super hard, like most residents do, 15, 16 hours a day, six days a week. I was in Chicago and I noticed my body was changing. It was getting away from me. I put on about 50 pounds over the course of a couple of years. I had anxiety, high blood pressure, fatigue, basically was like, you know, honestly, it could have been sponsored by Red Bull. Like I was like smashing Red Bulls like a couple times a day, <laughs> plus Starbucks at oh least. My God. I'm not exaggerating. When I was an intern, I was so sleep deprived. I could literally drink whatever Red Bull or a Starbucks and pass out like five minutes later. So, you know, sleep deprived, not exercising, working too much, not eating well, a lot of fast food, lived in Chicago. So, I mean, loved the classic Chicago foods and it caught up to me. And here I am, and I'm a doctor, but I'm a normal guy too. And I am vulnerable in the same way that any other person is to falling into these traps, to working too hard, to not sleeping, to not exercising, and to eating unwell. And I really couldn't find a way out of it. Um, I tried. Like, I'm a hard worker, so I tried exercising my way out of it, and I thought I could outrun it, and it just didn't work. And so I was like, I'm not exaggerating. This was after Chicago. I was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in my GI specialty training. And I would like go and work out for 30 to 45 minutes and then jump on the treadmill and do a 5K or a 10K or jump in the pool and swim 100 laps if it was the summertime. And I would do that like, you know, I mean, a lot of weeks, six days a week, just smashing workouts. And I could put on muscle mass and I could make myself physically strong and I could run a 5K faster and faster or a 10K but I couldn't lose the gut. And my brothers used to make fun of me for it because I was the only one in the family who had this. So young, single, like you can take my spleen if that means that I'm gonna be slightly more attractive to the girls out there. So that's what I was trying to accomplish. And I met the person who is now my wife and I had never been around someone like this before because she ate completely radically different than me. She ate plant-based. So we would go out to a restaurant and I would like be like, Hey, give me the pork chop and like, you know, some extra sides. And she would order a plant plate and she ate without restriction and like definitely was eating a solid amount of food and yet did not have any issues controlling her weight. I mean, from my perspective, she looked amazing. I still think she looks amazing. And she did it in large part with her diet. Like she wasn't, you know, smashing workouts the way that I was. And so it just opened my eyes. It opened up my mind. Adrian, you know this about me. I'm a science guy. I love science, worked really hard to get a master's degree in clinical research. And I did a fellowship at the University of North Carolina in epidemiology, in addition to doing my GI fellowship. So for me, the science has to be there. If the science is there, I'm on board. If the science is not there, then I can't, I can't do it. And when my mind opened up to this possibility that, you know, maybe I wasn't taught everything in medical school. When my mind opened up to this possibility and I started to look, I found like literally thousands of studies. And it sent me on this path where I transformed my own health. I lost 50 pounds, reversed the anxiety and the blood pressure and the fatigue issues. I mean, honestly feel like I reversed aging. I feel younger now than I did when I was 30 and brought it into my clinic with amazing results. Yeah, and I forgot to mention in the very beginning when you were talking about Chicago that we both went to Northwestern a couple of years apart. Mm -hmm. But I know, very excited to ever meet a fellow Northwestern grad, especially a fellow Northwestern grad for grad school because we both went there for grad school. You said something when you're describing your journey here that I thought was interesting and worth coming back to, which is that you're a doctor, but you're also a human being. And you know, if you look at the science actually, right, there's like a lot more unhealthy doctors than there are healthy doctors as far yeah. as lifestyle habits. 
Um, and I wonder if the conventional medical school system and residency programs kind of instill these bad behaviors because it's so much fast food and lack of sleep and this kind of like gunner mentality, um, which then they could, you know, carry on the rest of their lives, I, I would assume. But it happens for all kinds of different healthcare professionals. And it's a really interesting thing because a lot of people get into healthcare because it's a good job, it's good pay, it's interesting, not necessarily from personal experience. And so they're not really thinking about their own health or they don't think they're worthy of good health or things like that, or it's something that they can do later. This is just like a business or a job. I think a lot of patients forget that that's the situation. And so just because somebody works in healthcare doesn't mean they actually know anything about taking care of themselves, which I saw when I worked with hospitals, um, a lot of the administrators especially had, you know, nurses, nurse practitioners, things like that were obese, would, you know, joke with me if I didn't bring in donuts for a meeting, had lots of complex chronic health conditions. Mm -hmm. And we're still talking about patients in a very patronizing way. Like they didn't yeah. know how to take care of themselves, which right. I thought was interesting because I'm looking at them like, doesn't seem that you know how to take care of yourself either. But food is a huge piece of that. And I saw really unhealthy food behaviors. And I felt like if you could just get to people and help them understand how much the three meals a day, 21 meals a week impacted their health outcomes, like you said, everything else, you don't have to kill workouts seven days a week. You don't have to right. do all these other natural therapies that are available to us. The majority of your health can be pretty good just from what you eat. And then maybe there's a little bit further that you can go with some of these other things that we know about. And so a big part of that is the gut and big part of the gut is the fiber component. Very simply, will you help our audience understand exactly what fiber is and it isn't and why it plays such an important role in gut health overall? Let's take it from the top. I want you listening at home and, and you too, Adrian, to erase from your memory the mental image of your grandma stirring the orange Metamucil drink so that she could have a poop. Okay. Well, so, and also the one I have is like it written on some really sugary cereal box, you know, like the best form of fiber, like this many grams of fiber. I mean, my family even ate well, but I still think of fiber associated with breakfast cereal. So fiber, just taking it from the top, and I'm not talking about the supplement here. I'm talking about fiber as it exists in nature. Fiber is a part of plants. They all have it. Every single plant has a mix of fiber and the plants have a monopoly. Um, this is where you will find fiber. And if you want to get it, this is where you have to go to get it. This is the plant. Now, there are many different types of fiber. We have no clue how many types of fiber exist in nature. We have no clue. There's not even an estimate because it's so structurally complex. I mean, I'll spare you guys the like biochemistry nerding out crud, but just suffice it to say that fiber is not fiber. Counting grams is not the same. Source matters a lot. And when we start to think about fiber for simplicity's sake, given the complexity of the whole thing, we start to break it down into two main categories. And that is soluble fiber, which basically means that if you stir it up in a beverage, it will actually disappear, it will dissolve. And insoluble fiber, which is the roughage, which is the stuff that's always gritty and it will never dissolve no matter whether you boil it or no matter what you do you know, they have a little bit different properties. We have been taught that fiber goes in the mouth and it goes through the intestine and it launches out the other end like a torpedo. Like that's what we've been taught. And um, that is probably a fair way of describing insoluble fiber. That's what happens. But soluble fiber is like the secret of nutrition that people are not talking about and they should. And the reason why is because soluble fiber is prebiotic. People have heard of probiotics, which are the live active uh, microorganisms. And I know that they've been discussed in your show many times, so I won't belabor your, your audience. This is the prebiotic. And the prebiotic is what feeds and nourishes the healthy microbes. Every type of fiber that exists is going to feed these microbes. It passes through the small intestine untouched, unsullied. By the way, for you guys listening at home, if you wonder about resistant starch, the story that I'm about to describe is exactly the same with resistant starch. Resistant starch is not fiber, but the story is the same. They're both prebiotic and they behave the same way. 
So resistant starch is actually a form of starch. It's not, it's not actually a fiber, um, which is a different chemical structure. But resistant starch is not digested by our intestines. So, you know, other starches are broken down very quickly and can be broken into sugar molecules. You know, we think of starch as like, of course, like potatoes or spaghetti, like macaroni or things like that. Resistant starch does not get broken down. Resistant starch passes all the way through the intestine. Now you'll find resistant starch in a lot of places. White potatoes are actually a great source. Like people who, you know, trash white potatoes, there's no nutritional value there. It's actually a fantastic source of resistant starch. So whether we're talking about soluble fiber or resistant starch, it passes through the small intestine, unsullied, enters into the colon. This is where the microbes live. I know that your listeners already know this. This is the colon is the predominant place for your microbiome. 38 trillion in this location of bacteria. They get into a feeding frenzy and they basically just devour this food. This is their food not ours. This is theirs. They devour it, chew it up. They get stronger. They multiply. There's more of these anti-inflammatory microbes. And then what they do is they turn around and they pay us back by releasing what I think is the biggest secret in all nutrition, which are short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And I'm happy to talk more about them, but but before we go anywhere like that, just know Every type of fiber is unique. This is the general way that it works. The soluble fiber is prebiotic. That's the general way that it works. But every type of fiber feeds different microbes. They're not all eating the same fiber. And so that makes it unique because every plant has its own mix of fiber. If every type of fiber feeds different microbes, if every plant feeds different microbes, then what we have identified is that one of the ways that we can support many different types of microbes is with different types of plants because they have different types of fiber diversity. Yes. I remember when we chatted the first time, one thing that stuck with me, it's, you know, sometimes you know something and you really need to hear it in a different way for it to open your mind or to stick with you. And when you were explaining how much diversity is important and why I immediately ran, you know, to my husband that night and was just like, next time we go to the store, we are not buying anything we have ever bought before. It has to be different. We have to have more diversity. Da, 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 da. Does he hate yeah. me? How much does he hate me right now? I no, apologize. He kind of got it. I mean, he's a creature of habit in certain ways, but once I explained it to him, because I think you explained it very well. Um, and again, it's not like I hadn't heard that diversity was important or that different right. you know, colors of foods had different. Eat the rainbow, right? Right, exactly. Everyone's heard that. But right. I think that What's most important about health content for me as a consumer and also as a producer, and actually this is not even health content, this is everything in life really, right? Mm -hmm. When you understand the why behind something, it makes it a lot easier to have that conversation in your brain as to, you know, doing it, why it's important. It's almost like you can convince yourself more easily. The same thing with what you talked about. If the science isn't there, it's hard for you to implement it into your life because that naysayer part of your brain is saying, but does this really work? Or like, does this really matter? And I think we all have that. And so when you can understand more about the why and put it together that at this point, I think a lot of us know that gut is the basis of all health. And we know that there are probiotics, which are the good bacteria that we want to get into our our guts. And that we know that there's microbes already there and they need food and it should be obvious, but a lot of people don't think about that. And then when you think about, well, you want many different kinds of bacteria, right? That's mm-hmm. how a healthy microbiome looks. Right. So of course you would need different kinds of plants in order to feed them. Why would they all eat the same thing? Like that right. doesn't make sense. Right. And like, of course, different kinds of plants will have different kinds of fiber. It all makes so much more sense. I'm going to retire. I'll kick back and relax and you can take it from here because you got this. <laughs> no, it just, I, I wanted to reiterate it because it's a big part of your book. It's a big part of understanding fiber in general, and it's a big part of understanding the gut microbiome, which is not talked about nearly enough. I think a lot of gut health content today just revolves around like what probiotic should you take and drink more bone broth and these other things, but- Hmm, marketing, we were talking about marketing. Hmm. (laughs) We're all gonna eat three meals a day, right? Right. Most of us, unless maybe you're experimenting with intermittent fasting, which is a whole other topic, but let's say you do eat three meals a day, each one is an opportunity to introduce so much great food for your gut bacteria. 
or That's not, or right. so much damaging food. And so why don't, why aren't we starting there? Why are we always going to the supplement side or the things you're going to add in as far as like, yeah, just go ahead and eat your really beige style food, whatever, microwavable, and then like have bone broth afterward. Like, no, let's roll that back. Now that we've hammered home what fiber is and right. soluble and soluble forms of fiber. Now, can you help us understand what happens if people aren't eating enough fiber to those important microbes in their gut? And I think it's a critical issue because one of the big points of my book is diversity, abundance, right? And this is the philosophy that I'm, I'm trying to instill in people, but that is actually quite divergent from what we've been told for the last 15 to 20 years with most of the popular diets that people have been doing. What we've been handed for the last 15 to 20 years is a list, not this. You're not allowed to eat this. And I'm kind of coming in and saying, look, there's one rule. It's simple. You don't need to count your calories. You don't need to weigh your food. You don't need to worry about macros. You just need diversity of plants. And so let's break that down and look at both sides of it. Diversity of plants, you already explained the reason why this makes sense, the reason why it's so intuitive. I don't need to go there. But let me just back it up with the science, because like I said, I'm a science guy. The single biggest study to date to correlate our diet and our lifestyle to the health of our gut microbiome, specifically looking at the diversity within our gut microbiome, which is a measure that, that all scientists agree, more is better. You want more diversity. In this study, more than 11,000 people, again, biggest study to date, they found one factor that was the clear-cut number one thing associated with a healthy gut microbiome, and that was the diversity of plants in your diet. So the science is backing it up. It's not just intuitive. It's not just you and I agreeing that, okay, that makes sense. This is actually the biggest study, the highest quality research that we have to answer this question. What actually predicts a healthy gut? This is the number one thing. The flip side is what, what happens if you start eliminating foods? All right, now there are 300,000 edible plants on this planet. Adrian, just give me an estimate, whatever number pops into your head. In a given week, how many different types of plants do you think you would typically consume prior to our first call? May the record reflect, prior to our first call. <laughs> Maybe like 50 or 60? In a week? You're a wonder woman. Maybe 40? I don't know. Okay. Well, either way, that's a lot. I Maybe like six different ones a day and I don't know, times seven, 40-ish. Okay. I love that. Um, you are way ahead of the curve you are the, at the top of the class when it comes to this diversity of plants concept already. Most people are getting less than 30. Let the record show we have no way to actually prove this. So I could be <laughs> like 24 or something. Yeah. <laughs> 24 would be pretty good still. You know, I mean, I think to a lot of people, their concept of a salad is iceberg lettuce and with like one tomato that you cut four ways and then you smash it with, you know, blue cheese dressing and bacon and cheese. And, and honestly, that was the salad that I was eating 10 years ago. You know, I'm certainly not casting stones, but the, the point is that there are so many different plants that exist. Getting rid of one plant, you say, look, I don't want to do nightshades, so I'm going to get rid of tomatoes and eggplants. Okay. I honestly don't think that's the end of the world. If you focus on plant-based diversity, if you're focused on getting more variety of plants in your diet and you get rid of one or two, it's not the end of the world. Okay. But what I really want to discourage people from is categorical eliminations. That's where I get nervous. I don't like it. Categorical eliminations means that you take an entire category of plant food, like whole grains, like legumes, you know, just recognizing that those have probably been the two biggest categories that many people are looking to get rid of. You know, the studies are, are very consistent in their findings, whether it is looking at a gluten-free diet, whether it is looking at a low FODMAP diet where people restrict FODMAPs and then don't reintroduce them, or whether it's looking at the paleo diet where people eliminate grains and legumes, what we consistently find is that it actually damages the gut. It actually damages the gut microbiome, each in their own unique way. There are specific microbes that exist within your gut that thrive when you consume legumes. And if you get rid of the legumes entirely, you can't replace that. Now, can you say, I don't like kidney beans, but I'm gonna do lentils? Yeah. You can totally do that, right? If you take whole grains and you eliminate them entirely, there are microbes that thrive 
on the consumption of those whole grains. And there's also microbes that are suppressed by those whole grains that frankly you don't want. And so to kind of unpack that one a little bit more, there was a study looking at the effects of the paleolithic diet on the gut microbiome. This was out of Australia, by the way. They looked at three groups of people, all right? They looked at hardcore paleo. Those are the people that are like, no beans, no grains, not near me, not on my watch. They looked at the more moderate paleo people who are employing the concepts, many of which, by the way, many of the concepts I love, right? Like elimination of processed food, I'm with you. Elimination of dairy, I'm with you. But also elimination of grains and legumes. They looked at this other group, this camp that's moderate paleo, not as hardcore. And then they compared it to people who are just eating a regular, not a plant-based diet, but just a very regular balanced diet and looked at the changes in the microbiome. And what they found is that the people who followed the paleo diet actually had a less healthy gut microbiome. It actually increased the production of something that's been very hot in the scientific literature recently called TMAO. TMAO is produced by the bacteria in our gut and it's been connected to heart disease, the number one killer. It's also been connected to stroke and to kidney disease. It's not good. You don't want it. You don't want TMAO. And it's produced by our gut microbes when we consume red meat. Red meat contains carnitine. Carnitine basically starts this ball in motion. What was interesting about the study is that the, the group that had the highest TMAO production, again, like everyone in the study ate meat. It was not a, looking at vegans or something like that. The group with the highest TMAO production was actually the hardcore paleo people. And their meat consumption wasn't any different. They were eating the same amount of meat. So the, the people doing the study said, well, what's the deal with that? Like they're not eating any more meat. Why, why are they getting more TMAO? We don't want that. That's bad. What's the problem here? And what they found is that when you cut out grains, you increase the production of a microbe called Hungatella. And Hungatella is the bacteria that produces TMAO. I find it interesting at a minimum or mind blown, whatever you want to call it, that in this study out of Australia, look, I'm not claiming that this is literally the top study of all time, all right? It's interesting. We interpret this as part of the broader picture. But I find it interesting that in this study, they find that the, the group that eliminates whole grains produces more TMAO, which is associated with heart disease because of changes in their microbiome. And here we are, and we have all of these studies that show us that when you consume whole grains, high quality research, systematic reviews with meta-analyses, what they find is that when you consume whole grains, you reduce your risk of death, you reduce your risk of death from cardiovascular disease, you reduce your risk of having a heart attack. So on both the larger level, population-based, and on the smaller level, microbiome, we're finding this, that the, the arrows are pointing in the same direction. Whole grains protect. So this is such an interesting topic and I think it makes a lot of sense to me yeah. uh, what you're saying because I've always been skeptical when people remove things that not only are like a, the basis of, you know, like one of the key fundamentals like beans, like you were talking about from right. a diet, but then there's also such conflicting research about how great it is. For example, beans, you know, the blue zones of longevity, which are, you know, something I talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the fundamental common foods between five different, very geographically and ethnically different blue zones around the world. Um, right. They all had this in common, which is that their, their diets were largely plant-based, but had like a daily bean piece, right? And then to say that those are absolutely something to get completely rid of. I'm like, how can these both, whenever something is so drastically different and the science on both sides is so drastically different my inclination is like trust the thousand year old wisdom like go to the godfathers or whatever like the people who have been doing certain things for thousands of years with good health not what our parents have been doing because they're like the unhealthiest generation in history but the ones that have lasted the test of time or passed the test of time mm -hmm. that's where i tend to go like the new fangled science that's great but no i'm gonna look to like the the buddha and see what they were doing. And so that makes perfect sense to what you're saying, especially about um, all grains or all legumes. I will say though, that we have a large autoimmune population in, in the wealthy audience and that autoimmune paleo has been, you know, one of the most healing diets I've seen or one of the most effective healing tools 
that right. I have seen for people with like two decades of second degenerative MS where they're in a wheelchair and then they just fix it all. Like they right. don't even have the markers for MS anymore. And right. it's really based on going to this kind of autoimmune paleo diet. And so I wonder how does that happen? You know, is there something that maybe needs to be done for bodies that are quite damaged versus just what's healthy for most people? There are many different diets that exist and there are many different ways to be healthy. And we don't all need to agree to do the exact same diet, okay? But I think that the, the way that I think about this is that number one, the autoimmune paleo diet, there's a lot that's really good there. And the part that's really good may be the key piece specifically for autoimmune disease, right? So elimination of processed foods, there are many different diets that eliminate processed foods. You know which one does not eliminate processed foods? A vegan diet. There are a lot of people who eat a junk food vegan diet, mm -hmm. all right? And so that is not a healthy diet from my perspective. The elimination of processed foods, just to speak for a moment about what's in our food supply, there are literally in the United States, 10,000 food additives approved to be a part of our food supply. None of them do we have long-term studies in humans, none. The few that do have human studies, which the estimates are usually about 20% that actually have human studies at all. It's like a short term, like, oh, you ate this for a week and you're cool. All right, we're good, right? Yeah. You don't know what that does when someone eats that way for 10 years. That's the problem. For a lifetime, yeah. Right, you know, you talked about the thousand year wisdom. These foods didn't exist a hundred years ago. Yeah. Forget a thousand years, right? I think that there's a lot of good that exists in those diets, in the removal of those foods from the diet. I'm happy to unpack gluten in a little more detail if you want me to, but let me just say that I think that you can be a perfectly healthy person. I am 100% plant-based. That works for me, okay? Full disclosure. But my book is not about turning you into 100% plant-based. My book is about meeting you where you are, recognizing the healing benefits of whole plant foods, and trying to move the needle and ramp that up. The average person in the United States is 10%. If you're doing AIP and you're 60% plant-based, I love that. But what if we made you 80? There is no evidence that autoimmune disease would flare by becoming progressively more plant-based. If anything, the evidence is on the other side, which is that we have many studies, whether it's thyroid or rheumatoid arthritis or even MS, Crohn's disease in my field, where a plant-based diet is good for these conditions as well, okay? So I guess the point, Adrian, is that I think that there are many different ways to approach nutrition for specific disease states. I celebrate people who engage in nutrition for the purpose of trying to heal themselves no matter what diet they choose because that takes willpower. So I celebrate those people no matter what they choose. I believe that the path to better health is through a predominantly plant-based diet. It does not need to be necessarily 100%, but I do believe that the closer that you move and you make the choice for yourself, I think the better off that you're going to be. My concern with these types of diets like AIP goes back to the paleo study that we were talking about a moment ago, which is that you don't necessarily pay the price in the short term. And I'm not trying to be fear mongering, but there is a risk of heart disease. That's real. The risk of heart disease is real and that won't manifest in one year. Any study that looks at one year of data, unless you use an adequate biomarker, like perhaps TMAO, any study that looks at short-term data is not going to tell you whether or not this increases your risk of heart disease. But in today's world, in 2020, we have to see the big picture. There's short-term gain, but we shouldn't necessarily take short-term gain at the expense of long-term loss if it means that we are exposing ourselves to the number one killer, which is heart disease or cancer, which is the number two. I have so many questions. All right, I think I'm gonna <sighs> do some rapid fire questions about fiber because go, go, go. I will have so many that I don't feel like I'm gonna have enough time. Okay. okay, first, I know I know the answer to this, but just wanna hear you say it. The fiber that exists in these processed and packaged foods like cereals, whatever, breads and stuff, your thoughts are? I don't like it. It's a processed yeah. food. I don't like it. It's a processed food. Why would, why would you go there for your fiber? Many times that they're just adding it in. I mean, why don't you just take the supplement then? Honestly. Right. So, and the supplement is not the path. My second question, if people are in a state of 
their lives or are actively working to heal or um, improve their gut health because they can tell, I shouldn't even say improve, they, they know they have some gut issues and sure. therefore want to work on healing their gut more than just the average person would be doing and want to really ramp up the amount of fiber that they're getting and either they're traveling or that for some reason they're not able to eat as many plants as they would be if they you know were home in their normal environment. Do you suggest taking a prebiotic supplement? I actually am a huge believer in prebiotic supplements. I take them myself. Full okay. disclosure, I don't take a probiotic. I do take a prebiotic. There's a hierarchy from my perspective. And I would have to unpack the specifics of someone who has a damaged gut a little bit more if you want me to. But to be as simple and short as possible, the hierarchy is diet comes first, prebiotics come second, probiotics come third. There is value to probiotics, but don't buy the hype because a lot of it is honestly marketing. So I have patients who benefit, but I have way more patients who benefit from a, from a prebiotic. And if you really want to transform your health, you can't go from a C minus gut to an A minus just by taking a supplement, whether it's prebiotic, probiotic, anything. Since you're on that topic, I know there's something that you've talked about in your book called postbiotics. Can you touch on that quickly? So we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the episode, which is that the fiber enters into the colon, the microbes get into a feeding frenzy, and then they release the short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids are an example of a postbiotic. Basically, anytime our microbes create a, what we would call in medicine and science, like I'm nerding out, a metabolite. A metabolite basically means that they're changing it. They're actually changing the chemical structure. So it's not fiber anymore. Now it's a short chain fatty acid and it heals. The key is it has to heal. That's a postbiotic. So short chain fatty acids are an example. Most people don't realize this. We all agree like resveratrol and wine, it's good for you, right? Beta carotene in carrots, good for you, great for your vision. All right, there's all of these plant chemicals that are polyphenols. And most people don't realize polyphenols in their natural state do very little for our health. They are transformed by our microbes. They pass through all the way to the colon too. And then they're transformed and activated by our microbes. And so those are postbiotics as well. This is why um, pomegranate juice is great for the gut. And the reason why it's great for the gut is because the polyphenols and pomegranate, like there's no fiber in there. The, the polyphenols and pomegranate are prebiotic and can alter the gut. We also think that there's, I'm going to give a little shout out to everyone in your, in your audience who's like, okay, red wine. I don't want you drinking it every day, but red wine has prebiotics. So of all the alcohol that exists, it's actually the resveratrol that's prebiotic. Chocolate has prebiotics too. And in each of these cases, the prebiotic that I'm talking about is not fiber. The prebiotic is a polyphenol. But again, these are coming from plants as well. So when you eat diversity of plants, you get all of them. Well, that is great news because those are two of my favorite foods. Okay, next question I have for you. Raw versus cooked. So Both. I don't like when people limit themselves to just one thing. Raw can be very hard on the gut. If you have a damaged gut and you're starting to ramp up your plant-based diversity, get more plants in your diet, then you may find it easier to cook your food or do like soups and stews and things like that. But what we have found is that the fiber in raw actually changes when you cook it. So what does that mean? It actually means that you get different effects. So I think a cool little health hack is if you're cooking your food, let's pretend that you're going to saute some kale. Saute your kale, it's delicious. It's good for your gut but nibble on a little bit of raw kale because then you're getting that different type of fiber for your gut microbes too. More diversity. Interesting. So one further question on that because it was something that came up in um, an interview I did several months ago with Dr. Vincent Pedre, who's a gut health specialist, but he talked about, just like you said, that raw food can be quite hard on your gut. And there's some people who you know are raw foodists or there's a general perception that food has more nutrients when it's raw than when it's cooked. Right. And in some ways that's true, but I don't think people realize one, that if you have an impaired gut, it can actually be sort of harmful or difficult to then throw food down with these strong plant walls that your body doesn't have the enzymes or the microbes to actually break down properly because your gut has been so impaired. For somebody that's actually healing their gut versus just a general person eating normally, is there sort of an order? Would you say, you know, you really need to eat raw food until the gut has healed and then you can introduce raw or is it just kind of, you want to do both all the time? 
No, I, I agree. I think that there's a process. I think there's a process. And so when you're in the process of healing your gut, it's about, and you and I have talked about this a little bit before, but we haven't really talked about this yet today. It's about ramping up, right? It's about exercising your gut. You treat your gut like a muscle. What does that mean? It means that your gut can be stronger. It means that you can exercise. It means there's a certain amount of exercise that feels really good. And there's also a certain amount of exercise where you've gone too far and you hurt yourself. And that's true with the food that we eat. You know, if you have a damaged gut, you can't go and pound and smash the five bean chili. You're just not built for that, right? But you may be able to do some lentils. And you start there and then you expand and you do more and more. I think intuitive is completely fair when it comes to this type of stuff. Because you, you can't like ramrod it down and say, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to force it on my body. Because you're not going to feel well when you do that. It's about finding what you're actually capable of. And sometimes this is where a nutritionist or dietitian can help. And honestly, this is where my four week plan in the book is designed. It's not meant to be a four week plan. Like you just do it. It's meant to be a four week plan where you learn something about yourself. You identify where your food sensitivities lie, and then you understand better how to make adjustments. So on the topic of food sensitivities, cause yeah. you're right. We did talk about this the first time we had a conversation and I thought it was fascinating. And then haven't touched on it as much today, but if somebody is doing an elimination diet, say, and they remove, you know, all foods categorically and start adding things in and have some beans and feel bloating, feel gas, do not feel good, right? They're probably thinking, as they've been told in the process of elimination diet, that food is not for you, right? right. So they're thinking, right. okay, beans are off the table or eggs are off the table. I just have to avoid those. Right. So that kind of contrasts a bit with the idea that, you know, you got to like work your gut the same way that you would work into an exercise routine. You got to kind of push it along and, and, and not to remove everything completely categorically. So right. how do you like reconcile those two things where someone does an elimination diet, doesn't feel well in reintroducing beans and then says, okay, I guess I can't have beans, but you're saying that could be quite detrimental to their gut. So how does that. If I'm speaking to that person right now, the first thing I want them to know is when they eat those beans, and they feel unwell, that is not inflammation. There is no evidence that that is inflammation. The evidence is that that is sloppy digestion, sloppy processing. And you see this occur in people who have a damaged gut. It's food sensitivity. And so if you eliminate that food entirely, I'm gonna tell you how this plays out, okay? This is conceptually similar to, I just tore my ACL, all right, my knee hurts. Right. So if you, if you injured your knee, you have two choices. Now I, I, I realize most people will think this is ridiculous that I'm even posing these options, but this is conceptually similar to what's going on here. If you injure your knee, you can either stop walking, get a motorized scooter. You will never feel pain in your knee again. I can assure you, if you stop walking, you won't feel pain, but the problem is your health will suffer. Your legs will get weak. You'll gain weight. Potentially you get metabolic issues like diabetes, high blood pressure, right? That's not a good path. We all know that. So what do you do? You get the surgery and you rehab your knee and you build the strength back up so that when you're done with that rehab, you're jumping, you're playing basketball, you're skiing, you're doing whatever it is you enjoy doing, right? That's the path that most people choose to take. They choose to rehab. They accept that it's not necessarily going to be easy and there may be some pain with it, but it ultimately will get them to where they want to be. With the gut, the science is clear. If you eliminate the food, when you reduce the diversity in your diet, you are going to basically cause the, the species of bacteria that thrive on the consumption of legumes, which is what we're talking about in this case, they're gonna die. And they're gonna disappear. They won't be a part of your microbiome anymore. And now you have a less diverse microbiome. Loss of diversity is what's associated with the manifestation of disease as a result of the gut microbiome. You have not made yourself more healthy and you have not improved your digestion in the process. These people I see go deeper and deeper and deeper into food restrictions and they may feel better on a temporary basis, but they're not better long-term. This is not fixing their issues. The elimination of the food is not getting rid of their gut health issues. They're just kind of covering it up because they're not testing their gut with the food anymore, right? I guess with the answer, what you kind of alluded to is that there's a difference between digestive challenges and inflammation. But right. I think about how 
um, we say, listen to your body. You know, if you're getting mucus after you eat dairy or even a stomach upset or whatever, you know, cut dairy out of your diet. But then we're saying, listen to those same cues for, let's say, beans, but don't do the same thing. It's like a little confusing to people. So I feel like that would be helpful to explain the difference. We could go scenario by scenario. Okay. Let's take gluten, for example. One in three people are trying to be gluten free right now. It's way more than it needs to be. Let me preface this by saying I'm not sitting here and telling you that I want gluten to be the centerpiece of your diet. It's only 1% of people that actually have celiac disease. It's only 1% of people that have a wheat allergy. And that leaves 98% of people who are left over. And yet one out of three, about a third of people, are trying to eliminate gluten right now. There are some people who exist, when they consume gluten, they get a rash. If that's reproducible, you should eliminate gluten. There are some people who exist, when they consume gluten, they will get joint pain. If you eliminate gluten and the joint pain goes away and you reintroduce gluten and the joint pain comes back, you should eliminate gluten. By the way, both of those scenarios that I just described, the studies would say that at least 80% of those people actually have celiac disease. So it's not just an isolated rash or an isolated joint pain. It's actually that they, they have this genetic condition. That's a genetic condition. If you eliminate gluten casually, if you're not a nutritionist and you don't know how to replace for it, we have studies that show that the people who eliminate gluten from their diet increase their risk of having heart disease later in life. And the reason why is because they have eliminated their number one source of whole grains, which is wheat. Again, like I'm not saying that I want more gluten in your world. I'm saying there are forms of gluten containing foods like Ezekiel bread or sourdough that are actually really good for us. And when we categorically eliminate the food, we throw the baby out with the bathwater and potentially suffer the consequences of that categorical food elimination. And for what it's worth, just to kind of close that gluten out, because gluten is kind of complicated, but just to close it out real quick, you can go gluten-free and be perfectly healthy. If you have celiac disease, you can be perfectly healthy going gluten-free. The key is that if you eliminate gluten-containing grains like wheat, which is the number one source of whole grains in the American diet, you need to compensate by introducing non-gluten containing whole grains. You don't want to eliminate the category. You want to bring in whole grains, but just opt for the ones that are gluten-free, like quinoa and sorghum and teff. And you know, there's like 10 of them. Like you said, I think gluten is very complicated. We could have a whole thing on it just because of the autoimmune connection and all these yes. things that are- it is complicated. Yeah, I mean, especially because like the wheat in America is so different from the wheat in Europe. Right. Like there's all these pieces. So that one's a complicated one. But I think in general, just to summarize, I don't want to confuse people. I want them to find that they have some really clear takeaways um, is that with regard to food sensitivities, your gut actually does need to be worked a little bit. It doesn't mean having, you know, horrible stomach pains and continuing to eat that food over and over because you're trying to work your stomach. It's about paying attention to, okay, I have digestive issues with this food. Something's right. up with my gut. If my gut was working really properly, it would be able to digest this food well. Assuming this is also a plant-based food. If this is a heavily processed food or a food containing food dyes and additives, and or maybe it's an animal product, that reaction might be worth eliminating full stop. There's a difference between, um, this is a plant that exists in nature. It's not that there's something wrong with the plant. It's that there's something wrong with my stomach or my gut for not being able to break it down versus Captain Crunch does not exist in nature. I am getting reaction to eating it. I think I should just let this one go. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I see it based on what you explained. So those were some of my rapid fire questions on fiber. And I have so many more, but we're coming up on time. And I know you have a family and a life, so I'm going to get you back to them. But given that we are in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic um, and you know, we don't know where it will be exactly when this episode airs, but I think it's worth talking about because the takeaway after this pandemic for all of us will be, we don't want to continue to exist with chronic health conditions. Like whether that's just chronic heartburn or heart disease or diabetes or just migraines, you know, just because they're not a disease doesn't mean that they're not a chronic health condition. A lot of people in my audience have said, oh yeah, I don't have a chronic 
health issue. And then five sentences later, they'll tell me they get chronic acid reflux or chronic mm. migraines or, you know, things like that. And I'm sort of, I have to say, yeah, you do. You wouldn't be getting those if you didn't have a chronic health condition. So I think it's interesting, you know, a lot of people don't identify it as being sick necessarily when they have something like that because they're functional. But let's say whether you have a full blown disease or just a chronic health condition, either way, if you are dealing with that, if your microbes, if your whole immune system really is dealing with that, when something big comes along like the coronavirus, it doesn't have the army, it doesn't have the resources to fight that. And so you're much more susceptible. So I think the big takeaway when this whole pandemic is hopefully eventually over will be that we need to think and eat every single day with our immune system in mind. Yeah. And so would you share with us, you know, kind of a few thoughts or your best tips for eating for your immune system and especially with regard to fiber? I wrote the book. There's definitely conversation about the immune system in the book and now here we are and our entire life has been like turned upside down and we're dealing with COVID-19. And honestly, I feel like the book fits in well because it's about optimizing the gut. And I'm not aware of a diet specifically designed to optimize the immune system other than to say that 70 to 80% of the immune system lives in your gut. You go down there into the gut and here is 38 trillion microbes and there's a single layer of cells. And on the other side is 70 to 80% of your immune system. They're all hanging out together. And you can't separate the two. If you damage one, you affect the other. And so this entire conversation that we've been having about how to optimize your gut health, to me, optimizing your gut health is optimizing your immune system. And we actually have studies to back this up. You know, you and I have been talking about postbiotics. We've been talking about short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, without question, there are dozens of studies looking at the effects of short chain fatty acids on our immune system and how they allow it to optimize. Now, I think that the main point that I would want to make to your listeners is that everyone's looking for the hot supplement, all right? Just like in gut health, taking a supplement, you can't go from a C minus to an A minus with a supplement alone. The health of your immune system is going to be proportional to the health throughout your entire body. It's going to be proportional to the health of your gut and you want to optimize your gut. And so taking a supplement is simply not going to get you there. What you need to do is you need to change your diet. And they have this one study I just wanna share real quick, I hope you don't mind, mouse study, where basically you can't do this in humans, okay, because this would be unethical. They subjected these mice to the influenza virus, also a respiratory virus. And then they basically put them on two different diets. One was a high fiber diet, one was a low fiber diet. And they watched what happened. And what they found is that the mice who received the high fiber diet lived longer, had less severe symptoms. And when they objectively measured their lung function, it was better. The investigators were actually quite surprised because they expected the opposite to be true. They thought that the high fiber diet would be anti-inflammatory and actually stop them from being able to clear the infection. So. They went and looked at this in more detail. And what they discovered is that the short chain fatty acids, which were coming from the fiber in the high fiber diet, were optimizing the immune system. And what that means is that they were activating the CD8 cells, which are the fighter cells. They were getting more of the fighter cells in position to take on this virus. Getting the right cells in the right spot to pick up the fight is what you want. But the flip side of the story is that you don't want your immune system to overactivate. An overactive immune system is what leads to the acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, which is what people are ending up on a ventilator with, ARDS. That's the immune system. That's not the virus itself. That's actually the immune system overreacting. So we don't want more immune system, we want optimal. And what they found is the short chain fatty acids turned up the CD8 cells to fight the virus, but the rest of the immune system actually turned it down. And that's exactly the result that you want. So from my perspective, whether we are in the midst of the pandemic or whether you are trying to heal, whether it's your immune system or your gut post pandemic, I honestly think that the answer is the same and it's not a supplement. It's eating a nice clean diet. And then let's include the other stuff that has an input on our gut too, because it's not just fiber. 
there's all the things that you can get with that, without even lifting a fork, like getting a good night's rest and exercising and having a way to get rid of your stress. All of these things can optimize your gut. When you optimize your gut, your immune system gets optimized too. Beautifully said. Can you give a couple quick examples of short chain fatty acids that people can eat today when they're hearing this? Any prebiotic fiber, and by the way, every plant has prebiotic fiber, okay? So the beautiful thing is you don't need to necessarily go for just one or another. But I am a big believer in legumes, aromatics like onions and garlic and leeks and shallots. If you love cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, these are the cancer-fighting foods. And there's a specific phytochemical found in these cruciferous vegetables called sulforaphane. And I'm like totally obsessed with sulforaphane. There are hundreds of studies showing us how beneficial this is throughout our entire body, the whole body. And the best source of sulforaphane is quite surprising. It's not adult mature broccoli. It's actually the broccoli sprout. You take the broccoli seeds and people at home, you can do this. It's not hard to do. You take the seed and you sprout it and it takes anywhere from four to seven days. And it's like the least mature form of broccoli that exists. And that has literally up to a hundred times more sulforaphane than mature broccoli does. It's very bitter. I have learned to embrace the burn. You feel the burn like Bernie Sanders, <laughs> feel the burn. And what's cool is it has these healing effects throughout the entire body, including uh, it, it actually prevents cancer through seven different mechanisms. But what I think is cool about it is that, and I talk about this in the book, it actually also changes your gut in a way to produce more short chain fatty acids. And so it kind of comes full circle where it's like short chain fatty acids are the currency of gut health. And when you have them, you're well. And the problem is that in the United States right now, 97% of us aren't even getting the minimal amount of fiber. I think it's the CDC's recommendation, which you know is below what it should be because they're just thinking about averages, right? Not right. optimal levels is, I think more than I probably get in a day. I mean, it's really, it's amazing how many of us are lacking and, you know, it doesn't mean every day I don't get it, but there are definitely days of the week I don't. And they're saying right. that be every day and it's really amazing and it's worth looking at. And I'll put the article version of this on getwellbe.com so that people can really see, you know, what those recommendations are because there's real science, which you've talked about, and it's very serious. And most of us aren't getting it, even if we consider ourselves to be quite healthy eaters, because we're thinking about all the unhealthy things like junk food that we aren't eating, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're getting enough plants mm -hmm. to account for this guideline, right. uh, which we know is so important from everything you've just said. So I feel like it's also a cultural shift for me and for a lot of the listeners of this episode to not just think of yourself as, well, I don't eat, so I don't drink soda. I don't eat fast food. I'm a healthy eater then. But no, right. it's also how many plants are you getting and how exactly. many different plants are you getting? Exactly. To up. And to go back to your main point, which I love, which is that the diversity of the plants that you eat is really equivalent to the health of your gut, which is equivalent to your immune system strength. Yep. And that's the foundation. And it doesn't have to, we don't have to make it so complicated. It can be that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. This is the last question, which I ask every single guest I have, which is how do you get Wellbe? So get Wellbe is obviously our website and all of our social channels. And the get is, you know, a big part of the mission at Wellbe, which is that health doesn't happen. I mean, it takes work. You have to cut up those vegetables and shop at the different farmer's markets and have the willpower to try new things you've never seen before and look up recipes about how to cook them and all of that. And so I want to know the things that you do every single day that you really are taking an active role in your health. And when you don't do them, you noticeably don't feel as well, or you can just tell that you're not being, you know, your most well self. It can be one thing, it can be two or three, but basically how do you get well be? I get well be with a great smoothie in the morning. I get well be when I have a salad at lunch with as much plant diversity as possible. I get well be when our family's having home cooked meals for dinner. I get well be with a great night's rest. I get well be when I'm exercising. But above all else, I get well be with real people. Social connection is what we are about. It is really tough right now with everything that's happening. We are meant to be together. It grates against our nature to pull us apart. 
and this is why this makes it very hard. But I get well be by celebrating the people in my life, the people that I love. And I really hope that going through what we're going through now, that it brings all of us closer. That we stop hanging out in tribes and we start looking at each other as people and just loving on each other. So, because I, I think that. that's what we need to be. Yeah, gosh, well, that is extremely timely. I feel very similarly. I feel like this is the most bizarre situation. And I know that it's the number one tool for prison torture, right? To isolate people. It, that's yeah. how unnatural it is. Right. Um, so I think if anybody listening to this who's been isolated for some time and really isn't having any real human interaction, like lives alone, for example, and is feeling depressed or weird or like something's wrong, that's totally normal because that's a very human instinct. But also, like you said, I think just the realization of every single human on the planet having the same objective for once has made me realize that some positive things can come out of this, which is that we are all going to see that the tribal instincts are not helpful <laughs> and can be quite hurtful, especially because the globe is getting smaller and smaller and that something like this can spread as quickly as it has and infect us all and destroy communities. And it's the same everywhere. You know, and I think when it was just China, Americans could say like, oh, that was this foreign disease. And then as it spread around and realized, no, it's affecting everybody the same way everywhere. We're all mm -hmm. human beings. We all have the same gut health, the same gut, you know, the same immune system. That's true. We have the same microbes. Yep. The same insides, right? Different microbes in different places, but it's pretty wild how much this has shown me in just a short amount of time, how similar we really all are. And yep. so I hope to get to meet you someday in person, but until then, will you tell everybody where to find you and also when your book comes out? My book launches May 12th. You can come find me at theplantfedgut.com. I have an email list, very active. Uh, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of stuff, including all the references to my book. I also have a guide to the coronavirus. And then last thing, you can find me on Instagram at the Gut Health MD. Great, thank you so much. Well, I hope you have a great night cooking a home cooked meal with your family. I know that that's what we're all doing right now because we have no other option, but it's also been just wonderful, I think. Yeah see cooking come back into our culture. It's been so missing for so long for most Americans. And it's really the foundation of, I think, a healthy diet is being able to cook for yourself. For sure. Thank you again and have a great night. All right, you too.